Hey, hey, we're back. How y'all doing? Hopefully you're uh, enjoying some of this uh, decent weather. A little windy out there, and it's been hot, but... Uh, not now. Not now. And I think we're on the tail end of summer, aren't we? No, I don't want to You think there's some yet. more hot days left? Yeah, probably. But the rest of the next seven days... I'll take them. going to be pretty sweet. All right. Let me get to the comment page, just in case we miss somebody. Hope you're all doing good. Uh, hey, we're going to talk about... Um, by popular request. By popular talking. request. One person. <laughs> Uh, hey, John, wanted uh, wanted us to discuss this uh, topic, and it's the history of motorcycles. And uh, I'll say this, uh, I don't, you know, we don't claim to know a whole ton uh, about all this. You know, Google is our best friend anymore. Um, Kim knows more about older motorcycles than I do because he's way, 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 way older than I am. By at least double. <laughs> and uh anyway so let's uh let me give a shout out to uh bmf twins steel customs la cycles performance power sports uh reminder about the open house september 11th at hoy vintage cycles uh from 11 to 4 we're gonna roast a hog we're gonna have uh some other food and snacks um you can feel free to bring your own drinks and food if you want to uh, but we'll be uh, taking donations for uh, food and uh, uh, to support our two benefits that we're going to do. Um, yeah, Kim remembers when the, those uh, 1800s were new, right? <laughs> yeah, I had one. Uh, Roger's digging in on you. Yeah, Roger's older than I am. Uh, let me see here. Um, yeah, so uh, interject as you want. Uh, you know, we may have some stuff wrong here, but you never know. Uh, you know, Roger, you're, you're up there in age too. So you've seen a lot of these old motorcycles, but not the ones that we're going to talk about. Maybe not in the 1880s. I not in the 1880s. Not even Roger. I hope then. not even Roger. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's just get started with this. Um, w one thing that I found was in, uh, in 1867, there was a guy named Roper and, and I guess he's American because that's what uh, Google says there for me. Uh, he was a creator and inventor of a steam-powered two-cylinder, uh, how do you even say that word Velocipede. There? Velocipede. And so what is a velocipede? It's a bicycle, basically. Yeah, I, I was thinking it was a tricycle or something, but I guess that would have tri in it. Yeah. Um, this was essentially an early form of bicycle. There, it just told me I just needed to read a little bit more, and then I would have sounded a lot more smarter. Yeah. <laughs> but he did get it from me. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a two-wheeled, um, uh, two-cylinder, steam-powered motorcycle, and I'm actually going to show it to you here. So let me get to the brand and uh, find this bad boy. This is what it looks like. And uh, that is one interesting dude. Looks like some of the say. CB500 customs we've worked on. <laughs> I don't know. It's got a better seat. I like those straight bars. What do you think? Yeah, and I, and I like the front end rake too. What do you guys think about this one? Is this yeah. this one would be a good one to take down the down the tail tail of the dragon. It looks like it has a relief tube on it, too. <laughs> just, just in case. Which way do you sit on that thing? Uh, not at all. If it was me, <laughs> that seat looks uh, pretty wild. Um, Anyway, so uh, that's one of the earlier ones. Now I know, um, but I know that was made of parts that you'd see on a carriage. You know, like if it was behind yes. a horse, it would have all this stuff on it except for that steam thing. Yeah, yeah, the boiler. Right. Maybe it's, a boiler maker it's always made that. Good to have the boiler <laughs> right between your legs too. Uh, okay, what's the next good. one we got there, Kim? I'll uh, find so a the picture next of one it. shows the one that I'm most familiar with, which is the one that was built by Gottlieb Daimler and Wilhelm Maybach. Um, some of you might know Wilhelm Maybach's granddaughter was named Mercedes. And uh, as a result, they changed the name of the company from Daimler Benz to Mercedes Benz at some point because of his granddaughter. So this preceded Mercedes and they were building all kinds of stuff. But this was in 1885. And that wow. vehicle that is, interesting, isn't is it? actually in Stuttgart's museum. And I've been fortunate to be there and see that in person. And in it's person. not a replica. It's the one. You had a chance um, to touch it, and you didn't touch it because... I had a chance to touch it because it had signs. It had signs. Touch, but I was one of the only people in the museum that, that was didn't. not touching things. Um, wow. But yeah, that, that thing, thing is, is in there. It's awe-inspiring to see it, if for only the reason that it was so pivotal to going forward with an internal combustion gasoline engine yeah, uh, driving amazing. a wheel. So 
that was it was interesting i mean it's tiller steered it has no suspension it's made of wood mainly but they were putting a gasoline engine on a vehicle yeah, for the first time. That's unbelievable. That, to me, Looks that's, like it has like training wheels or just uh Yeah, those drop helpers. down just in yeah. case, you know, you wouldn't want to hurt yourself, but uh very interesting. Uh, the one of the linkages though that I wouldn't have been able to quote is in this document that you printed which says uh they they received help from an engineer named Nicholas Otto who in 1876 created the first ever four-stroke internal combustion engine. And Triumph was founded in England, would go on to become Triumph Motorcycles. And Nicholas Otto was okay. part of that transition, too, which is interesting. That's pretty neat. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, now we've got an early, our next one is an early Triumph. So, this one was um, 1894. Am I still on the right one right there? Uh, well, no. There's a fun that's fact the about Elder Brown and Wolf Oh, that's York. right. Uh, but that is a Triumph motorcycle, and that is not an English Triumph motorcycle. Okay, so it's we're going to show that one. Triumph motorcycle. There we go. Yeah. That that Look was that one. Bad boy. Certainly by comparison to the first one that Daimler built, that is very sophisticated because it's got some front end rake. It's got a little bit of suspension. It's got hand controls. It's got a, a, a crank starter, uh, a throttle of sorts, and, you know, a saddle that has a little bit of suspension as well. So that would be a way more practical device to use yeah. with pneumatic tires and things on a, on a, more or less normal and road. there were a lot of bikes that eventually have had that look you yeah know, a lot of the early harleys when you think about uh, where that engine early is 1900s and how it's got a cross thing in the frame with the way the tank they did the tank it. and all that yeah there's a lot of design points of that motorcycle that are still on bikes today for sure all right so 1894 a german company called uh, hildebrand uh wolf muller became the first to create a factory production line to create these vehicles and to make the name of their product more clear they dubbed the vehicles uh motorcycles and we all thank them for that thank you for that we call them now <laughs> yeah, i guess this is the one i should show right there for that one right yeah so if you look at that thing um again look at that air intake <laughs> yeah um again that's a not a four-stroke engine that's a kind of a total loss single cylinder thing that that <laughs> runs the thing. through that gearbox but it isn't there's no valves there's no you know anything like that it just drags fuel down into a combustion chamber and fires it and moves it back and forth so it changes vertical motion or you know, horizontal motion to rotary motion through that drive shaft and those gears in the back. So it's, it's, um, again, early, um, gear driven com or not combustion, but it's gear driven transmission, I should say. And again, the way that thing's built, the fuel tanks above the engine, uh, they were all gravity fed back in the day and still rudimentary suspension, but, um, there's a water tank in the rear fender there. That wasn't the first time that was ever done, but it was done later to cool it down, which is kind of cool. A water cool bike. That from, is pretty interesting. From 1894, which is only, you know, you think about that, it's only nine years after that wooden thing came from Daimler. So it was, it was a lot of technology all of a sudden. Yeah. And now we're going to, then we're going to move up to 1999. It says here, Charles H. Metz was responsible 1901. for 1901. Is that 1901? Yeah. Well, what about you the- You got to put your glasses on. Oh, okay. 1901, considered the dawn of motorcycles in America. Indian motorcycle used um, Dion yeah, buttons. The, the Dion Buton, that's a French Dion. company that built a type of drive. Uh, and that was a common thing to use, uh, the Dion axles. And it just means a live rear end. On yeah, and let me see if I can find the picture of that one. I don't have these in order, unfortunately. Yeah, if you see a, like even a Formula One car that has swing axles with a moving suspension in the rear, it's a Dion. Oh, here we go. It'd be the reverse. It's located by trailing arms that hang it in place and allows it not to move. There you so, go. Yeah, that's Check a, that bad that's boy a very out. early Indian. Very early. That's one of them where if you have just that fuel tank, it's worth like eighty thousand dollars or something just <laughs> here's the, the other tank. one that's the uh, pictured right next to it there yeah i'd say you know drew crafton would say that's a a more common end in twin mm -hmm. um probably from the maybe the aughts oh nine ten something like that um right. let's see yeah that's what that says here um and then some people don't know i mean again that looks a lot like a motorcycle does today uh certainly looks a lot like a harley 
um, V twin <laughs> straight up and down crank goes across the frame engine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, carburetors on those things were total loss. Like were airplane engines, they were either wide open or not. And the way you changed their speed was through the ignition cut out. So there's a lot going on there, but I think part of the electrics are in that box sitting on the gas tank as well, sitting above it. Uh, but not much different than a bicycle with the exception of the fact that the engine's an integral part of it. Again, right. I'm sure that's a very rare piece right there. And this is kind of uh, how it has the look that uh, uh, Matty may have gotten some of some of his yeah, creativity that from. that does look uh, a lot the, like the his national bike his that he nationals, does. Yep, in the same era. Uh, other than Actually, the engine. So read this next one here for us there, Kim, uh, 1903. Yeah, so before we move on to the Harley, let's just talk a moment about uh, Glenn Curtis, who at one point built the fastest vehicle on earth, and it was a... 4400 cc v8 that used to be in an airplane that one right there those engines were in, those engines were in jenny's you've heard of the airplane called a curtis jenny those engines were in that airplane and he put one in that motorcycle and i think he went 136 miles an hour if i remember right yeah he did and that was on like um a, like daytona beach talk about the opposite of vape hangers <laughs> yeah but <laughs> think about one. think about what that would be like going 136 miles yeah, an hour that would be full on sketch i think and i think glenn probably had to have a special place near the seat for his uh appendages <laughs> just for willing <laughs> willingness to do that at all um it's pretty cool so in 03 to steve's point uh, william harley and arthur and walter davidson started the harley davidson motorcycle company um and when they did that I think there were a lot of other things that they were interested in doing, but they really imagined that uh, it was going to be something people would use as a practical matter, not so much a sports thing. Check out the white wall. Oh, they're not even white walls. No, they're white tires because natural rubber is that is color. White. Yeah, and mm -hmm. they have to put color in it to make it black. And I think they put charcoal in it, if oh, I remember right? correctly, yeah. to make them black. But they were white at first because that's a natural color of it. Um, a lot of people uh, make white walls for their tires just by um, basically wire wheeling the black right off of the, the tire. Really? Yes. Okay. Go I'll, I'll Google take it. your word for that. Um, <laughs> Google it. <laughs> so it says the first ever Harley Davidson motorcycle will be distributed and sold in Chicago. That I don't know is widely known. Everybody thinks it's in Milwaukee, but yeah, I don't know. You know that that's the the main uh, home of Harley Davidson of record today. Um, and it says here, the engine creation proved to be speedy and it constantly won races. I think you could, could imagine that as soon as there were two of those things within a block of each other, there was going to be a race. Oh, uh, I know, would, No matter I who would, had what at any point. I would was, guess so. Whether it was yeah. a horse or a donkey or a motorcycle, I'm sure they were racing whatever they had. And Jan said there. carbon makes tires black. Oh, there you go. There you go. Thank you for that. Um, so in 1909... A uh, little bit of local information here. Oh, yeah. The Indianapolis Fun Motor fact. Speedway had the first of seven motorcycle races there, sanctioned by the FAM, which was the, pre pre the predecessor of the FIM, which is an international motorcycle um, thing. And this was the Federation, Federation of, of American, yeah, motorcycles. American Motorcycles. So it was early uh, AMA stuff. Uh, it was a two day, 15 race program, but ended before the first day due to suitability of the brick surface. Again, imagine that you're riding on a surface that's a bunch of bricks, that uh, yeah. some of which come loose during the event and pop up and lay on top of the track. Not good. Yeah, he probably wouldn't want to do that. And it says here, oddly enough, no motorcycle races at Indy for 99 years, and the MotoGP returned in 2008. Uh, the long-lamented loss of the MotoGP, that was such a great thing here. That and I'm was. hopeful Roger Penske looks for a way to bring it back. Um, there was a lot of complaints as much as... It was hard to hear mm -hmm. uh, from the riders about the track, and that was after they did really? some resurfacing. They didn't like the track because of some of the transitions and some of the things about it that they felt were not conducive to MotoGP. Huh. Interesting. And I know that there was at least one effort to try to repave it to make it better, and they, they now have uh, AMA-type races there uh, every year. Yeah. And they, they had them last year, and it wasn't as – well, attended as MotoGP, but, you know, it wasn't as broad an right. interest. But it's still worth going to see if you haven't been there. Try yeah. to go to see that. I'll tell you what I like Moto most America about now. it when we did have it here is that there were so there was so much going on that weekend. And uh, 
of course you had the Moto GP and then you had uh within that you had the rolling concourse and if 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 you don't know what the rolling concourse is it's it's basically a a bike show uh where you bring your bike and you get you put it in a category and then uh there's this uh secret location that everybody's supposed to travel to and your bike is supposed to make it to that location and it's back like 50 miles i think it's about 50 miles I think it was sponsored by Cycle World for the round trip. Yeah. yeah, and if you're, you know, if your bike doesn't make the trip back, then it, it does not qualify for the the rest of the show. Yeah, uh, to get judged. And I think that's the way it ought to be. I think that's pretty neat. I mean, uh, I've, I like I've that. Had a bike in a show, and I didn't win the category I was in. And after it was over, I went to congratulate the mm -hmm. guy that did win the category because mm -hmm. I thought his bike was cool. And I said, you know, I've looked at it, though. I wonder what it's like to ride it. He goes, I wouldn't have any idea. It doesn't run. Oh, that's brilliant. And I thought, oh, great. Yeah. You know, I, I lost to an ashtray. Well, my my Honda Dream, so I was excited because I, I had only had the Honda Dream for a couple of years. And uh, I took it to this event. I, it was two years that I was able to take it to this event. And um, it got, uh, it didn't win, but it got an honorable mention, which I thought was pretty cool. You know, oh, yeah. for, at least for me, it was cool at the time. And uh, then I found out, hey, Tim Cadwell, then I found out um, that it was because of the modern windshield I had on it. Oh, no. They said it was, it, you were it was too you were in the top three. It, I think it got a third place or a second place uh, honorable mention, and it was because of that modern windshield that was on it, which to me, I didn't know, I didn't know it was modern. I thought it was an older windshield, but. Yeah, it's one of those it real simple Buco things. It had that skirt yeah, on it. It wasn't even Buco. Yeah. It looked right. Yeah, if I'd have had the actual Buco that I have now on it, yeah, that would have been. It would have won first place. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, probably. Probably so, yeah. I would have voted for it. Uh, oh, I was going to mention what else I liked about the MotoGP weekend. Um, so not only did you have that, you also had events going on at Speedway. You had the Ducati guys. They would have their little get-together, of course. Yep, they had the um, show the on Main Street. They would have the uh, motorcycles on Meridian, three basically three nights in a row. And then not only that, but you would have the Indy Mile. Yeah. And uh, so all that going on. And then they would still have uh, other flat track racing going on at the Marion County Fairgrounds. Yeah, and they've resurrected the Marion County Fairgrounds for well, a number good. of things, including yeah. sprint car races now. Oh, well, that's good. And that's only been this summer. So if you haven't been there, you might want to go take a look at it. Good to hear. Yeah. So, all right, moving right along. That was fun. Indianapolis 500. So now we're going to, uh, what, 1914? Uh, says there were 30 motorcycle manufacturers in the United States, which that kind of blows my mind. Indian was exported worldwide uh, and was the largest maker in the U.S., other uh, pre-depression American motorcycle makers include Excelsior, uh, owned by Schwinn Motorcycles, Henderson, Ace, Yale, Cleveland, Pierce, um, and there's a big list. Flying Merkel, um, uh, some of these I even know about, <laughs> and uh, and I kind of got into motorcycles um, uh, late, you know, compared to a lot of you guys. Um, and uh, Harley Davidson uh, was in there too. Indian and Harley Davidson were the only motorcycle man manufacturers uh, to survive the Great Depression. So that's kind of interesting, right there. Yeah. So one of the reasons why they survived the Depression was they had board track races, which were really heavily attended, mm -hmm. and it was about wagering more than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, people would show up to make bets on the on the bikes and the riders and they were going well over 100 miles an hour on a board track that was more like the uh velodrome in indianapolis a really high banked oh yeah relatively short track they weren't mm -hmm. miles they were three eighths or quarters or whatever did anything uh was there anything to do with uh harley lasting because they, they were used in uh, as military vehicles uh did well, that have anything to do with it too, you know, this or? preceded uh the first world war but in okay. the first world war they started making motorcycles specifically for use in wartime for a okay. lot of reasons okay and wartime had History dramatic class. effect on so many things including the development mm -hmm. of technology for weapons whether it was aircraft or machining or techniques to work metal um, it changed the way motorcycles were made and something I was thinking about, I didn't read it in here, but something that always surprised me. I, I know a little bit about the history of Japanese bikes. I know a little bit about the history of, of British bikes and many of the motorcycles that were made in Britain in and sold in the fifties and sixties were based upon engines that were actually used as generators and auxiliary power units and oh, aircraft. Okay. And they made them out of aluminum, which was fairly unusual back in the day. 
Um, so like a 500 Triumph Twin or a 350 Triumph Twin, those were generators in um, Halifax aircraft. Oh, man. So, you know, if you if you see one, one of the generators, it's very obvious wow. that's what it is. Yeah. And they were the first, the British were the first to airdrop little motorcycles to commandos that were going behind enemy lines so they could travel quicker. Um, and it was an ugly little booger, but they still had them and they dropped them on parachutes and picked them up. Oh, I was going to show a, a picture of the uh, Indian V twin, the 1915. Uh, this thing is super cool. Yeah, they're beautiful. That's just that would be an example of an over restored, such one. a nice one. Yeah, all that nickel plating on the engine <laughs> and stuff. But yeah, that that right there, you what know, a cool if, ride. If you're current on what things like that go for, that's in the you know hundreds of thousands of dollars range now. Wow. Uh, again, Drew, we need Drew Craft, and that's going to be one of our goals to get Drew Craft on Let's this show. Yeah. He will do that, and he'll give us a much better background on all of this. Good. Uh, but again, you, as I'm reading through this, it's talking about the First World War, European yep. and American companies, and in the 20s and 30s, Guzzi, BMW. Obviously, Guzzi is an Italian company. They were in lockstep with the Axis during World War II. So German BMWs, uh, you know, everybody might already know this. It's old news, but... The BMW emblem, the logo, the blue and white, that yeah. actually is supposed to depict a whirling propeller. That's what that really is. Oh, okay. Uh, because they built aircraft mainly. Okay. And so when you see a modern BMW with that that four quadrant round rondelle, they call it. Yeah. Uh, that's what that Standing is. That's supposed to be a spinning propeller. And you know, all of those companies built vehicles to be used in military. Um, environments as weapons. So, you know, they were pretty good at building them. Guzzi did that. Um, you know, if you've ever heard of um, an Augusta that were made by MV, they make helicopters and farm equipment and, okay. you know, Laverta made farm mm -hmm. equipment. So they're technology companies that just happened to build motorcycles, which was right. the way it worked in Japan as well with virtually everybody but Honda. And, you know, we can talk about Honda sometime yep. later here, but I had yeah. a Guzzi. The Eldorado was a really cool bike. And it was like heavy equipment. It's like as a well. tractor. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Fun fact: 1937, Sally Robinson became the first woman to ever receive her motorcycle license, and I don't yes. have a picture of her. I don't know about Sally. I've never heard of. I've I've never heard of that. Mm -hmm. But um, but that's something that's, you might want to research. Research it out. Yeah. 1940s World War II ended, and motorcycle sales in America and Europe skyrocketed. This was due to the large number of veterans returning home after having ridden these vehicles during the war. Uh, it turns out that these men were anxious to own their own bike. This was uh, when the cruiser design became popular as well. Yeah, so I don't, I don't agree with all of that. I think one of the reasons why there were motorcycles after the war is because they were trying to ramp up production of anything that people could buy to get economies get the off economy the ground. Going. Yeah. And there were many, many contributors that were building motorcycles because the cars were just too expensive for people to buy so they could buy a motorcycle. In fact, in England, um, motorcycles were so much cheaper that in order to avoid buying a car, they would put a sidecar on it and be able to haul more people. And that was a common use of a motorcycle with a third wheel on it. And they even migrated into building three wheeled vehicles that were taxed differently than some of the other stuff that was out there. And I see there's something else in here that says uh, cruiser design became popular. I'm not sure that became popular everywhere. There were motorcycles mm -hmm. being built in different places. If you're a f uh, follower of the Isle of Man, you know, they've been racing that race since the teens. Um, and there have been bikes there that were not American bikes at all. Okay. Um, you know, there you go. BMW colors from the Bavarian state. So white and blue makes sense. And oddly international racing colors for America are white and blue. So, you know, go figure. But yeah, it, you know, when veterans came back to wherever they were fighting, they needed something to get around. And I think motorcycles were cheap and available. Yeah, I so would say so. That. And another fun fact that's not in this about motorcycles is the reason Volkswagen got off the ground is because the British restarted the factories in Germany. Oh, okay. And they, it was really the company that ran Austin in England that decided they were going to build that car instead of some other things they could have built. They built the Volkswagen. Okay. And so, you know, Germans may leave that out of the details, but it was really a, a British effort to get that back off the ground. I should have pulled out some uh, Pook information as well. 
yeah, you know, so there was I'll, maybe the on the second. Yeah, we'll talk one. about Pook then. We're going to do a part two, and, part two next next yeah. week. But ne- we're getting into the 40s. The 40s going on up, and this is kind of where you know. I mean, I myself recognize uh, this this type of uh, a bike a little bit more, uh, just because we've had a, a couple like this in the shop. Um, let me pull the uh, branding down and pull up this uh, really cool Indian. This would be a 1949 Indian Chief. So um, I don't. We haven't had an Indian an old Indian chief, uh, in the shop, but we've had a 1950, uh, panhead. Uh, and we've had and, a 1919 DL in there too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's and true. It was a flathead twins. Uh, I think it was 500 CC mm-hmm. displacement. Um, and that, that is what, there's a bunch of stuff going on with that bike right there. It's got a sprung front end. It's got uh, a sprung rear end. It has a suspended saddle. It has a Kickstarter. It, it's not a uh, pedal starter. It's a Kickstarter. It has an internal expanding front brake, and I think it has the same thing on the back. Um, and it's got suspension in the front on that girder. So there's a lot going on with that bike that you see on modern bikes. And, and I think uh, the balanced fenders and some of that are styling cues that people use even now. There's a Kawasaki. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but it looks just mm-hmm. like that. It's a right. pretty modern bike like in the 90s. It looked a lot like is it, that. Is it the Vulcan? No. Not the Vulcan. It's called something else. I forget else. what it's called. Yeah. But it looks just like that. Yeah. That, that's Same cool stuff. Bike. All right. Well, here's a lot of um, text information here. Um, mid to late 40s. Meanwhile, three brothers in uh, Italy. Where, where is that? Italy is in Europe. No. How do you, sp- <laughs> how do you pronounce baloney <laughs> uh, that's bologna bologna and, okay there we know, go see so this was connected to one of the most important things that happened in italy was the development the brains I've of got the, the radio yeah right guns out sends out um and marconi <laughs> uh was very famous in uh, as was nikola tesla and they were both italians and they came up with a lot of different developments in inventions that came along so there were some things that happened as a result one of them was a ducati so we're first getting into thing. ducati yes ducati's first thing was radios um and they eventually migrated away from radios to some other things including uh, a little engine that you would attach to a bicycle and i think it was called a cuculo and it was and it means puppy or the pup or something like that somebody out there is going to correct me but probably similar to this i don't know what that is right there yeah, it's similar to that, but that's way further down the development yeah. road, I think, than when you just bolted the engine to a regular bicycle on the front end. Um, yeah, that's that's that cool. is a Ducati though. Yeah, that's a very very early Ducati, of course, but it's a cool one. Nineteen fifty. Right? Yeah, there you go. Right here. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a Cuculo. <clears throat> so, so you know, Bologna. You, like it says here, uh, Ducatis were successful through the thirties. But World War II halted production when the Germans occupied the Ducati factory. So, yeah, uh, that was one of the reasons why they quit making Ducatis. Yeah. Well, when I hear um, Ducati, I don't see this uh, in my mind, right? <laughs> uh, no. And and something else in here that's interesting that I wouldn't have known, the brothers had hidden many of their motorcycles to hold them back, but the alloy bombing destroyed their plant in mm. Porgo Panigale. So when you see uh, a Ducati Glad now, the highest speed one of the most exotic Ducatis you can buy for the street. It's called a Panigale, which harkens back to the name of their factory in 1944, which is interesting. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot going on with these motorcycles in the development that they experienced after World War II. There was a lot going on in Europe. We can talk next time about what happened to the British motorcycling industry from being world dominant to yeah, that'll losing be interesting their, and going and in. I know a little bit going about into that the one. Japanese. And then bikes. we can talk a little bit about Soishiro Honda and what he was doing first. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the lowest hanging fruit with that is his first endeavor was building piston rings um, in the 30s and made a contribution during the war as well uh, before they ever built anything that resembled an engine to put on a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. Well, you sent uh, some guys out there to check out the Kawasaki, and it was the Drifter, and I remember that now. Yeah, Yeah. so Roger, Ron, and Jan. Jan, you win. You win something. I don't know what it is, but you... Bill Malico uh, from Iowa. Look at that. You are the winner. That's cool. (laughs) Hey, Malicote. Uh, Malicote bought uh, that Blue Dream 
that blue dream off of me. Oh, the nice one. Uh, and uh, no, no, not the nice one. <laughs> oh, not the nice one. No, okay. It, was, it had a really nice wheels, didn't it, William? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we totally rebuilt. There the, was a really nice one. We totally rebuilt the wheels uh, for him to put on that. And he's okay, he's then. done a lot of work and collected a few more. And uh, who knows what else he's got out there. I've seen a few pictures. But uh, anyway, okay, well. So um, I want to thank, before we end, I want to thank yeah. the people that showed up Saturday at the Automobilia. If you haven't been to that event, you need to go. I know I said this before, I'm saying it again. This was the first time they had an organized group of motorcycles. It was very well received. Uh, we're going to try to do it again next year. I'm going to ask that people who think they have a motorcycle they would like to have in the show. I want to try to organize getting more bikes there because the bigger the presence we're we have, take the more respect. Yeah, <laughs> so, somewhat. I'd like to be selective. Yeah. So, you know, if you've got something that... Uh, you think is unusual and interesting we'll give that some thought and submit it and i want to try to make sure people can bring them yep. physically to the facility rather than me hauling 30 bikes there right at once shout out to mike hubert also for uh, yeah, helping he worked out all day shout i out wasn't to, able to make it up there yeah, i was, he was watching the, shop. the actual shop yep. uh, shout out to ray guy i don't know if ray's watching but it ray was, it was great to see ray at that event um and great to see everybody that showed up and i found out that there were a lot of people who don't watch this live but they do watch it and they Afterwards. watch it on youtube yep and there were people that came that's up nice and to know talked about this show format and they really liked it so we'll keep doing it and uh, today was yeah. 28 by the way steve pointing Episode out that it seemed like five minutes ago that we started 28 this. weeks and there were actually about three that we didn't do so yeah 31 weeks early and there's well <laughs> you'll probably continue to do them when i'm gone next week or two weeks out but yep. yeah yeah we'll keep them going maybe i'll dial in yeah, and uh, suggestions as uh, as usual. Uh, this was a suggestion of uh, uh, Randy Schwartz. So uh, thanks, Randy, for suggesting to talk about the motorcycle history. I don't know as much uh, about it, but uh, we can go out there and, and learn some things uh, off the Internet and talking to people like Kim that have been around a little bit longer and, I like, and been doing it since I'd he like was little. I'd like to consider, I mean, we can branch off this in 10 different ways, but one way I'd like to branch off of, of it is – when did your motorcycle history start? Mine started in 1966. Um, yeah. And when did you start taking an interest in a particular kind of bike? So I think we can talk about racing bikes. I think we can talk about show bikes. I think we can talk about street bikes, dirt bikes. We can Different go down, preferences. We can go yep. down any rabbit hole you want to go down and spend a whole show on it. Yep. Um, so we look forward to doing that. I and mean, we'd just like your feedback on what you'd like to see that you didn't see tonight or what things you'd like to add. All right. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.